Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 237 of Humanity Rising. I want to note as we begin our session today, uh, the movement of the moon. As you uh, all know, the moon has been full over the last several days. We've had a super moon, uh, a pink moon, as they call it. Uh, and each evening, uh, I've gone out to gaze upon its fullness, its roundness, and feeling the love reflected uh, from the sun on the other side of the earth onto the moon that reflects its fullness back to the earth. And it's been very moving to me because I've been reading an extraordinary book called The Shape of Ancient Thought by Thomas Machiavelli. Uh, out of the University of Texas, one of the most extraordinary books that I think I've ever read. And he just happened to be pointing out while I was contemplating the moon that in antiquity, uh, in India and in Mesopotamia and Egypt and Greece, there was a very lively conversation. And the symmetries of astronomy and astrology and the movement of the stars and the planets was very much connected with the music and the octaves and the fifths of different instruments and the numerology of, uh, of sound. And these ancients had figured out the harmony between the astronomical movements of the spheres with the musical sounds of different instruments. And they had seven classic instruments that they played in their temples that corresponded to the movements of the planets and the sounds that the planets made and the sounds that the musical instruments made. So when we were listening to Gary Malkin on vibrational intelligence and how listening to music, singing, oming, can harmonize our frequencies. That's also what the moon does in its fullness. So as we start today, I just wanted to bring in the thought of contemplating the harmony between our astronomical movements of the planets and the stars, the musical resonance of our octaves and our fifths as we create our music and the sounds as one refraction of a single harmonious whole. As we contemplate these things, let us begin as we always do uh, by just centering ourselves for just a moment on our bodies. Our bodies are instruments. Our bodies have the seven energy centers corresponding with the movements of the spheres. Let us take a few deep breaths and let us place our attention on our hearts. Listen to your heartbeat for just the next minute in a spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude that you're alive, that we're all alive at this extraordinary moment in the human journey.
Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> and now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, I want to commence our program uh, by noting that probably the deepest revolution occurring in humanity at this time in a world where revolutions in technology and politics and economics and science are abounding all around us. The deepest one, in my view, is the revolution occurring at the level of our gender and our sexuality. If you look back over the last 75 years uh, since the Second World War, there's been a cultural foment around the world. As human beings, after thousands of years of patriarchy, thousands of years of repression at the hands of our major religions, specifically around our sexuality, and that's been true East and West, all the axial religions, with very few exceptions, have repressed our sexuality and put us in a straitjacket of gender. Uh, but at the beginnings, it was not so. In our origins, in our Aboriginal, Indigenous origins, it was not so. And so we're very privileged today uh, to have someone with us who has an intersex identity, Donovan Ackley, uh, who has been exploring these uh, matters through his own transformation of body and soul and identity, uh, but who also as a scholar, as a PhD, uh, who was a full professor and uh, dean of a department in religion uh, for many, many years, uh, but who became increasingly preoccupied with uh, the matters pertaining to gender and sexuality uh, in his own identity. Uh, he came out in 2013 and since then has been uh, active uh, not only in the United States but globally um, working in uh, the community of people who are um, breaking out of the constrictions of the traditional box of uh, gender and sexuality. Uh, so we wanted uh, today uh, to invite uh, Donovan to Humanity Rising uh, to discuss one of the most uh, fundamental transmutations of identity and value that pertains to how we humans understand ourselves, relate to others, and understand and relate to the larger uh, human a community at this extraordinary time of revolutionary change all over the world. Uh, so Donovan, uh, welcome to Humanity Rising. Uh, and I would love to uh, have you begin our program today by just simply uh, telling us your story and telling us uh, your odyssey as you have been contemplating these very deep matters of gender and sexuality within yourself uh, and then as you've understood it in terms of the larger cultural changes that are happening in society worldwide. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. Um, I will go ahead and start with my story, but as, as we're about to delve in there, there is one thing I would want to clarify and that for me, this has never been about me. Uh, and in fact, my scholarly life and my transition were not about um, me asserting myself or going on a personal journey. It wasn't anything like that in my experience. I am just a person that was trying to live my life and do my job. And um, I think as we talk together today, that'll become more evident. And that, that seems to be true for most people who are gender minorities. It's not about being revolutionary or trying to prove a point. It's just folks trying to live their life. So I'm going to share my screen with y'all for a minute, and I'm going to show you some some pictures because I, 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 I've been convinced, I did this with my own students when I started to come out and this is what catapulted the events of uh, 20, 
13. So I'm sharing my screen. Can you all see uh, pictures of a little child? Yeah, we're good, Donovan. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So I've just, uh, with my with my family's help, I, I went back into the family archives and found some photographs. So what I want to start with is just to say, as you look at this little person, um, I was, uh, when I was born, my mother said, it's a boy, which, you know, looking at me now probably doesn't seem that surprising. But the, the, the thing is, the doctor said, no, this is going to be, this is a girl. And um, so I was, that's what went on my birth certificate. Um, and um, yeah, I know we only have a limited amount of time. Uh, my experience was I was raised uh, by parents who were very open minded. Of course, the 1960s and 1970s were a time when there was uh, a second wave of women's liberation going on. Uh, and uh, they were very open minded about gender and sexuality. And uh, I was able to, as you can see, I was able to live as a very androgynous little child. At this time in my life, I certainly wasn't a gender studies scholar or a religion scholar or anything like that. I was just a little kid. And in my little childish mind, when people would ask me, what are you gonna be when you grow up? I'd say a cowboy or the president. I assumed I was gonna grow up to be a man. And nobody told me that nobody, we didn't have gender arguments in my family. It wasn't, you know, I'm just saying that to kind of normalize this experience. I, I have a, an intersex condition. Now I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's my identity, but I have a biological condition. Um, let me go here to something else for a second. Maybe it would be helpful. Um, it's called uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. There are many, many dozens of intersex conditions. And I'm actually gonna just show you a picture so that you can understand. I have all kinds of different things in here, but let me just show you, um, first of all, fetal development. Are you all able to see a picture of what looks like a, a medical illustration? Yeah, we're good, Donovan. Okay, good, good. All right, so this is fetal development. And what usually happens is, first of all, all of us are undifferentiated. You might be able to see my cursor circling here. So all of us are in, undifferentiated when we're originally developing. And most folks will develop these undifferentiated organs in one direction or another. Uh, males develop in the way that's over on the right and females develop in the way that's over on the left. And some folks, um, it's a little more ambiguous. So I'm gonna show you something different here. So there are different scales uh, called the Prater scale, and there's another one, I'm blanking on it right now, but babies such as myself and many others, uh, it's about the same number of folks that are that have uh, red hair or the same number of folks that are born with Down syndrome, uh, so roughly in there. Um, some folks are born with non-binary gen genitalia that might look anything like any of these pictures here on the Prater scale. And usually what, what doctors do, as they did with me, is they're sort of decide based on the size of the, the phallic tissue, uh, whether that baby is going to be um, assigned as male or as female. But I'm going to get out of that now. But um, regardless of that, um, folks with ambiguous genitalia are people who are they have we have both sorry we have both um aspects biologically that are male and female and people who are i'm going to stop sharing my screen i would like to stop for a minute and just talk to people <laughs> um so we are um there we go we are just people and uh some of us may totally identify with the assignment that we were that we're given as as males or females most intersex folks are able to live in the gender that they're assigned at birth um and all of us have i shouldn't say all of us because there may be exceptions but many of us have biological complications in my case so you saw that androgynous little kid um i had um in the early 1970s in the midwest uh, of the united states i things were not uh 
very feminist yet. So I had to wear dresses at school and that was something I had not done before. Um, they had me grow my hair, my mom had me grow my hair out long. I had to start living as a girl. And I, I still felt I was gonna grow up and be a, a man. So that confused me and I was very uncomfortable. Um, I started going to therapy when I was eight years old with depression and anxiety. I wasn't able to really feel comfortable around other kids. I was bullied because I was different. Um, and I'm not trying to make this all about my childhood. I'm only bringing that up to say the roots of gender difference can be biological and that they can, they're not, they're not generally things that just start when someone grows up and decides to be revolutionary and radical and uh, rattle the chains of gender ideology. It's, uh, it, it's, it seems to be a much more innate. And I want to take it away from telling my own story for a minute and just talk about the fact that back in when Freud, Sigmund Freud started psychotherapy, when, uh, when Carl Jung was seeing people, when, you know, going back to the roots of, uh, of the birth of, of psychology as a discipline, those folks saw trans clients, people we would call trans clients today, and they found that talking folks out of the under, their understanding of who they are never worked. In other words, even in the pioneering times when folks would try what we might call today reparative therapy or conversion therapy, it didn't work. So uh, in, by the 1960s, someone named, a doctor named Harry Benjamin in New York talked to those folks. He talked to Freud and Jung and, and, and different folks while they were still alive, got their case histories, and was seeing the same thing in his own uh, practice that he could not reparative therapy folks who had some sort of gender difference. My point is to say, again, just, just to reiterate, this isn't a new phenomenon. Doctors in the Western world have been seeing this for well over a hundred years, have, uh, have had consensus that you can't talk someone out of their understanding of who they are on the inside, even if it doesn't make sense to anybody else. And like I'm trying to bring up for a lot of folks or a disproportionate amount of folks who are gender minorities, there are intersex biological complications. Our endocrine system, and this is in, in my case, when I went through puberty, I, I, and this runs in my family, there are other people in my family that have this experience too. I may have looked more or less like a little girl growing up, but when I went through puberty, I grew a mustache. Um, I had chest hair, uh, um, other things grew, you know, my phallic tissue grew, not, not to be too blunt. Um, so my puberty was kind of a mixed puberty and uh, I had to take female hormones by the time I was 15 in order to menstruate, grow breasts and, and pass as a female and let, be less ambiguous to live in the assigned birth gender that I was given as female. I had to take dangerously high doses of estrogen and progesterone. I had to keep on doses that would normally be in the body of a woman who is nine months pregnant just to look somewhat less androgynous. So, um, you know, getting to Jim's question now, uh, by the time I started through menopause in 2013, <laughs> um, I, that wasn't working anymore. I was very, very ill. I'm not going to show you the pictures of what I was like when I was ill, but um, not only psychologically did that cause me a great deal of suffering as a man to be forced to live as a woman, but, um, but physically it made me very, very ill because my body is, that's my intersex condition, my body is wired to produce and, and absorb testosterone. That's what my body wants to do. Um, and uh, uh, so those, those female hormones made me very, very, very sick. So by 2012, um, I was skeletally thin. Uh, every other approach was tried. I'd been in uh, psychological therapies to, to deal with the depression and the anxiety of that for decades, about 39 years I'd been in therapy, 32 years I'd been on female hormones, and in 2013 we had to stop all that because I was physically dying from the effects of the psychiatric uh, medications they had me on for anxiety, depression, the hormones they had me on to help me look like I was a female. Um, yeah, so we had to stop that in 2013. Again, it was not a gender issue. Uh, I was I was a scholar of religion. I was uh, a college professor at an evangelical university because I was always trying to understand this experience I was having 
And I have, I still, to this day, I, I have to believe there's a higher purpose in a way that we're all interconnected. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I may have a weird body, but I, I'm part of this universe. And that's helped me get through this, whether I was in the closet or whatever the interventions were that doctors were doing with me. I've had to be in a spiritual kind of humanitarian kind of acceptance with that. And that took me into the academic world and trying to understand gender from the perspective of various religious traditions and, 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 you know, we'll talk about that soon. I know that's one of Jim's questions, but um, I'm trying to get to the fact that, that certainly I saw that the world religions had some sort of real obsession with gender and uh, um, the one I was in, in an evangelical university certainly had very strong ideas about biblical manhood and biblical womanhood and and they didn't line up with my experience they seemed to be very repressive they seemed to be causing anxiety for my students so i did have an interest in gender even within sort of traditional conventional binary understandings to to liberate and i was raised by feminists you know active feminists people that were charter members of now and mis myths of charter subscribers of Ms. Magazine. So, so I, I, I was very blessed in that way, right? So I wanted to share this within this religious university context with students that, that, that is sort of, um, my point is not just for LGBTQ reasons, not just for intersex reasons or trans reasons. I, I was always concerned about ways that gender ideologies were used to harm particularly women. Um, and, and, that didn't line up with what I could see in the world religious traditions in, in a sincere way, not the distorted way that people use them politically for their own ends. But but uh, it seemed to me that there is some sort of truth, higher truth in those religions that I studied as a scholar and taught as a professor. And then, and that was what I was trying to get to. I know I've gone on and on. And on. Sorry for uh, it's a no, kind no, of no. a long, complicated story. I'm going to go back to sharing one set of pictures with y'all from what Jim asked about in 2013. So I was no longer able to take female hormones for physical reasons. I came back from a sabbatical, um, the sabbatical where I wrote my life. I, I wrote a book that has just actually finally been published called Sex and Sacrament. But uh, I came back from this sabbatical without the female hormones, but I'd been taking them for 32 years. So you can see that I look different in 2013 than I do now. I hadn't, my beard hadn't come in fully yet and things like that. But uh, um, so I went back to school and I looked different and I said, I really can't go by the name Heather anymore. <laughs> I'm going to just use my initials, uh, H-A. So I, ha I went, my name had, my given name on my head was Heather Ann. So I tried out going by Heath Adam so that I could keep the same initials. I, I underlined Adam there on the board. This is me. They asked me to explain myself to my students. So this is me in one of my classes taken by one of the uh, photographers, student photographers from the school paper at the time. Uh, and this, this picture went out all over the world because the world press got, especially the right wing press got very interested in this story. But, um, I was going by the name Adam because the first human in the Bible, ha, ha Adam in Hebrew, it just means the person made of earth uh, and was a person that didn't seem to be divided into two genders until the second chapter of Genesis. So that original person, person seemed to contain maleness and femaleness. Anyway, I was trying to be a bridge builder in my religious tradition, in my work context, and just to use and the same initials so that I wouldn't rout people's cage. You know, I didn't want to upset people, actually. Um, I'm wearing the trans pride colors. You might not be able to see that, but I, would, I, I had that made this little pocket square with pink, white, and blue. Um, and and uh, anyway, so these are my students. And what happened is the university asked me to leave. They said, you really can't finish out the semester under this circumstance. Um, one of my colleagues here, Alice, Alice Yafide, uh, was greeting me on the last day of classes. That I was I had given away my belongings from my university office and was about to teach my last class. And she said, may I give you a hug? And this ended up being in the Advocate magazine, uh, which is the LGBT magazine here in the U.S., the, the mainstream one. Um, 
my students did not want me to leave in the middle of the semester. I didn't want to leave them. We had we had a lot of work we were doing that was really great work. I was teaching a liberation theology course and a course on prayer, and you know, uh, I wanted to teach them out. The, the LGBTQ students were not officially recognized on this campus, and uh, I would had kind of been meant. They'd asked me to come in and talk to them about gender diversity in the Bible and sexual orientation, uh, same sex partnerships in the Bible, and things like that. So they. I was kind of a mentor. I was a diversity council chair on the faculty senate, so I'd been kind of advocating for them on campus. Anyway, I um, they organized a, a sit-in in their mandatory chapel services, and you can see they made T-shirts that say "We Stand with Adam." They made a, a little bedsheet banner. We all went to chapel together, and they just silently sat there as a collective presence to say, you know, we really don't want our professor to leave in the middle of the semester. Um, and then and the world media picked that story up. That was just, um, and, and so this is a little cartoon that was made uh, in one of the local papers about those events. So, so that's kind of what happened in 2013. I mean, I felt like those pictures of my students kind of make it a little bit more real. My students and colleagues were very upset about it. I didn't want to leave them in the middle of the semester, but I knew I was in an evangelical university and it probably, uh, they probably weren't going to be able to take this journey with me. Uh, I had regret about that. So I did uh, do one radio interview, one TV interview, and uh, I wrote a piece as invited to, but for Huffington Post to just kind of share that I wasn't at odds with them that I, you know, I, I shared a little bit about this is what's happening. It's a diagnostic change. That's what happened in 2013. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual of the American Psychological Association changed its diagnostic category for people with gender dysphoria or who have don't feel like they're the gender that they're assigned at birth. So in 2013, my doctors finally said, oh, guess what? You're not mentally ill. You're just a guy. So if you could just stop taking female hormones and psych meds now and just live as a guy, that's your new diagnosis and that's our new treatment plan. So I I absolutely was not seeking that. That terrified me. I had some sense that things were not going to go very well for me as an evangelical theology professor coming out and saying, you know, guess what? I'm sane, but I have to live as a guy now. And by the way, oh, I'm, I'm married to a guy and uh, I still love guys. I'm gay. So, you know. That wasn't okay with the folks I was hanging around with at the time where I was working. So um, anyway, that, in a nutshell, Jim, that's a big nutshell, but that's <laughs> what happened to me. <laughs> well, Donovan, that's an extraordinary odyssey that you're sharing with us. Thank you for your courage uh, for uh, sharing it, first of all, but also your courage as an individual to traverse the ebbs and flows of your life um, through the thicket of gender and sexuality and all of that and come out um, eventually authentically as who you knew you were right from the beginning. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing as you knew uh, from uh, the earliest age who you actually were and your parents and your culture kept telling you were different and your coming out was actually going home uh, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, as, as a hero's journey uh, uh, with a thousand faces, as uh, 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 Campbell would have put it. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, before we jump into the history, I'd love to have you just explain to all of us the distinction between gender and sexuality, because I think for most people, they're completely conflated, uh, but they're actually separate. So speak to us a few for a few minutes about that distinction. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, they certainly can interconnect, right? <laughs> and it's understandable that it might be confusing. But uh, in a nutshell, I mean, again, I'm sorry, I, I got to stop using that phrase. Briefly, um, uh, gender is more about who we are, and sexuality is more about who we who we love, right? Who we connect with. So, so sexuality is more about relationships and gender is more about who I am in my own skin. Uh, that's probably the simplest way to answer that question. Oh, that's a, that's a, um, so gender is more of a self-identity 
and sexuality is more around our attraction to the other, whoever that other is. It's our relational um, identity. Right, right. I, I, I think that's a really simple way to describe it. I mean, for one thing, you know, uh, my gender is my gender, no matter who, who I'm with. I, you know, my gender was something I, I was aware as a little child. Any of us probably were aware of our gender before we were aware of our sexuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you think about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and likewise, in, ha- in terms of how other people respond to us, people re- start gendering us before we even, we know about gender reveal parties in, in the U.S. at least. Uh, people start gendering us before we're even born and certainly at the moment that we're born. However, our sexual orientation doesn't usually become an issue for people until later on in life. Yeah, yeah. Because, we, we you, yeah. you know, I was a little boy. I was treated as a little boy. I was named as a little boy. I was dressed as a little boy, but I didn't become sexually aware of anything right. until puberty. And right. uh, in my case, it was around the opposite uh, sex, around girls. Uh, so for me, gender and sexuality were aligned, uh, but right. they, they don't have to be. Uh, they're actually distinct. So that's a very important uh, clarification. Thank it, you for that. It gets more complicated for a person who's intersex or who, yeah. uh, in that sense, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started our, our session today about the fact that uh, how how other people perceive your sexuality kind of is related to how they perceive your gender. So, um, yeah. So, so I've always been attracted to men. However, when I was perceived to be a female, people perceived me to be heterosexual because they perceived me to be a woman who loved men. However, after I came out, I could finally clarify, I've always been interested in men as a person who understands myself to be male. The way that I'm with men is as a man is with a man. And that's very clear to people now. But uh, when I was in that ambiguous state, people were a little bit like, huh? (laughs) (laughs) So uh, anyway, yeah, so I'm a, a man who loves men. So it, you know, I, my my sexual orientation identity is, is gay or at least queer, um, even though I was raised as a female. Yeah, and that hasn't always been clear to people. Yeah, I don't think, like you said, Jim, about your own journey, like it's not always this confusing. <laughs> but for a few of us, it may be a bit of a bumpier journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I found fascinating about your life is. That you've also given birth mm-hmm. to two children, mm-hmm. so uh, that must have been an extraordinary psychological, psycho-emotional journey to be identifying as male and yet having the biology that includes female, and actually going through the birth process of uh, of two children. Um, and I mean, what was that like in your? psyche i mean Mm -hmm. that that's a really good question jim and and it helps me clarify something that uh, i I didn't want to take too long telling my my story at the beginning but um because doctors had told me from the time i was eight years old and like i said i was in therapy from from the time i was eight years old doctors had told me i was just a very confused conflicted female and then when i went through puberty and i was put by medical doctors on female hormones I was told you're what the words I was told was not you have an intersex condition. I didn't get that diagnosis. I the doctor never told me that until I was 50, 50 wow. years old. Wow. So what I heard from medical doctors over the years was you're abnormal. And that is the only word I ever heard. You're abnormal. And they, um, so I believed that my what I'm trying to get to Jim is that I believed I was wrong. I believed and doctors backed it up that I was mentally ill. And back then it was called gender identity disorder. It was a mental illness. So I believed that and I complied. That is why I complied with the female hormones. I complied with all the different forms of therapy I was given over the years in terms of mental health treatment. I got to a point where after the birth the birth of my first child, and I think you're right to say it was doing something to my psyche, right after the birth of my first child, they started, I, I was, added to talk therapy was psychiatric medications. And doctors couldn't figure out why those psychiatric psychiatric medications didn't seem to be effective for me. So they kept adding more and more and more. At one point I was taking 25 pills a day, 
not counting the hormones, just different. Like, yeah, they had me on anti-dementia, mood stabilizers, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, it, it, really antipsychotics. And I'm, I know they meant well. They couldn't figure out why they couldn't fix me. But all of those things went away. In 2013, their criteria for diagnosing and treating someone like me changed. And, and they took me off of all those things. And I've, I've done very well in very difficult circumstances <laughs> without housing, without steady employment, without, you know, being scrutinized in international media and having death threats. And, you know, all kinds of really horrific things have happened to me since I've come out. But I've maintained stability. I'm just saying that to say, um, uh, yes, it was difficult. And one of the difficulties was I doubted myself and I believed the doctors and experts. Why wouldn't I? Uh, and, and also the religious experts, as I knew them at the time, uh, I tried to align myself with that female identity. I'm grateful that I got to have children. The only thing I can say about birthing my children is to this day, it, it often comforts me that I went through those difficult 39 years of reparative therapy and 32 years of hormone treatments that I got to have this amazing experience that most men don't get to have. Uh, and, and, sure. and for that, uh, I'm, it, 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 it's very much worth it to me that I went through those things because I got to have these children and they've had some of the same experience. I'm not going to they're not public people they're doing their own thing i'm just going to say that they i'm grateful to have had as a parent experiences that help me understand some things that they go through and help them navigate it differently yeah extraordinary donovan extraordinary um very interesting question in the chat here from uh, dr moria uh conlin uh, how did opening your yourself to gender and sexuality deepen your notion of the sacred i've written two books about that <laughs> that's that, that, uh, question, uh, that question is so <laughs> profound uh how did it deepen it the trust if i can just be brief that would be the it, it did deepen it i mean your question already answers itself it, it deepened it uh i i now don't have blocks to connecting with the sacred the blocks that i had before when i was diagnosed as mentally ill and abnormal in body were i had this god or this understanding this is what's wrong with me my whole spiritual journey was what's wrong with me yeah fix it god i surrender have i not surrendered in some kind of way i identified with jacob wrestling with god in in the genesis story i was like i think i'm trying to ask god's blessing i think i'm trying to be i was an ordained minister even i'd been ordained since the time i was 18. i really tried hard to follow what i understood to be or, or to seek what i uh, i call that higher power of god I, I was trying to seek god's will live in conformity to god's will and uh take suggestions from people that seem to be more trustworthy on that path than, than, than myself uh and i was in constant mis misery self-loathing and and i was trying to be close to the sacred but i felt so disconnected and abnormal I mean, that was what I was called all the time. And that's how I felt. I'm just abnormal. Uh, so the surrender actually that happened for me right before I came back from that sabbatical was to pray. You know, it was a one spiritual mentor that suggested to me for the first time, she said, instead of praying for God to fix you, why not try? And at this point I was 47 years old. Why not try just saying, thank you for making me the way I am. I had never done that. I'd been a minister at that point for 29 years. I had never prayed, thank you for making me like this. That prayer changed everything. So your question is right to the point. That was my own sort of internal coming out point when I surrendered in acceptance and, and have taken a path of gratitude as hard as it's been. And, and all the losses that have come with that and all the hatred from total strangers and the hardships for my children that have come for that from that still to just practice every day before I even wake wake up, get out of bed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and how have your parents um, responded as you've gone through your journey? Uh, were they supportive all along the way? Uh, how was that in terms of your larger family? That was so hard for them. Um, 
unfortunately, I, I learned the hard way. I was so excited about the gifts. Again, I told you my spiritual practice in this has been thank you, thank you. So I leaned into, ah, like as I shared with you at the beginning of this session, uh, my parents raised me free to be you and me. You know, this wonderful expansiveness of gender that came in the second wave of the feminist movement. And I was really grateful for that. So I was sharing that publicly when I was in that coming out phase and uh, being asked to explain that myself, I would always share, oh, my parents, so wonderful. They were they were sort of hippie-ish, you know, uh, alternative progressive folks that gave me this wonderful gift. Um, and the that is true. And the other thing I learned is that they're very private people. They're not public people. They're not, you know, speaking with media. So I want to be sensitive to the fact that for they each have had their own journey. Everybody that's my biological relative has had their journey to make with this behind the scenes within themselves. Um, some folks in my family, just as in, you know, any other family or setting, some of them are very attached to the bio, a binary understanding of the biology of gender. Uh, they did not know I had an intersex condition that wasn't just, you know, we were never explained as to why my body was different as a baby, as a, as a, an adolescent, whatever. And I was also told to be ashamed of it. And I, I never talked with my family about the stuff I was talking about with my therapists or my doctor. So my point is for them, what happened when I was 47 really kind of blindsided them and, uh, um, some of them have not made that journey. It was very, very difficult. I did not feel that I really had their support. They, they had a lot of processing to do. Um, and but my and my dad, uh, on the other hand, was the one who dug into those family photos and helped me sort all this out as I was going. As my diagnosis was changing with the therapist and the therapist was confused, I asked my dad, are there pictures? I remember this, this, and this. Can you help me find pictures of that? And he and my grandfather both named Donovan, Donovan one and Donovan two were the family archivists that dug back for those old photos that actually helped me show my therapist, you know, this is not something I'm just making up now in 2013. This has been an ongoing part of my journey. Extraordinary, extraordinary. Yeah. Well, let's, let's broaden this now, Donovan, because uh, you're a, uh, a scholar and you uh, know about the history of religion. You've studied the history of gender and sexuality. And um, uh, as I noted right at the beginning, um, your understanding uh, is that in our origins, in our primal indigenous aboriginal origins, uh, intersexuality um, was uh, not the norm, but it was there was no taboos, and in fact, there's many cultures where intersexual uh, individuals are considered as holy. So, just tell us, um, uh, lay out your 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 sense of the history of gender and sexuality. All right, thank you. Um, here is where I'm going to again share a screen so that I can show you. Folks that know better about this than myself, where am I? I'm sorry, I'm going to see where I'm uh, Here, I'll go here. Okay, sorry about this. Okay, so what I wanted to go to, can you see a map? Yeah, explore the map. Oh, beautiful. So um, this is a resource that I'm going to share that I would recommend to any of us. Uh, it's uh, a map of gender diverse cultures. You can Google this yourself. and. Um, but this is an interactive map, and I used this. I used to use this when I, I helped launch a, uh, a peer support hotline, suicide prevention line called Trans Lifeline in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and I used to use this with training those folks on gender diversity, and I've used it with students. I, I teach in gender and sexuality programs at various universities. So what I'm trying to get to is that other folks have done this work, right? And I'm leaning into their work. So what this map does is it shows us that all over the world, and you can see really on every continent, um, there are, these are just some of the other genders, not male, not female, but other genders that exist. So I'm gonna go to Mexico for a moment here, uh, the mujer, um, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, but a third gender in Mexico, uh, folks that are 
biologically, I guess we could say, uh, usually male. They're not necessarily intersex biologically, but folks uh, who would be assigned male or might have been assigned male at birth, but as they are maturing, it becomes clear this is someone who is more on the feminine if we understand gender as a spectrum i didn't even get into that yet but or a spectrum or a universe as some people are now saying that there's not just two points but they're in betweens and all arounds uh so um uh, Mushe, folks um are are people who were little boys perhaps and uh grow up to be m closer to women in, it's hard to capture this. The point is that, in, and you asked about it, Jim, in indigenous cultures, in various other cultures, um, we don't just have male, female, or even trans identities. Sometimes trans identity seems to imply that you're switching like a toggle switch between femaleness and maleness or maleness and femaleness. And what we see in other cultures, I'll go to an Asian culture. From, well, let me go to Oceania here the sister girls and brother boys um that you because you talked about aboriginal cultures in other cultures there are additional genders you don't have to switch from being male to female or female to male because there's actually a, other places to be on the gender spectrum if that makes sense so what we see is and still today this isn't just ancient practice there's here we see uh, i went to africa for a moment in egypt um, there were trans men, we would call maybe trans masculine in our culture or our culture. What am I saying? Western cultures, uh, contemporary U S folks like myself might call this transitioning from a, a female to a male identity, but this is a third gender, uh, folks who would be assigned female at birth perhaps and become men. Um, what I'm trying to get to in, a, in in brief is that there are other places to be on the gender spectrum. The Mahu is who I really wanted to talk about too. So these are indigenous folks of Hawaii that again, this is a, a different gender. It's not male, it's not female. It's, um, it's, it's an in-between. Um, I'm gonna stop with that particular let me let me go to actually this no not that one sorry let me go to uh, i'm just gonna have to stop sharing for just a moment what i'm trying to get to is is that uh if we, if we if you looked around in the inter interactive gender maps more you'd see there are two spirit folks still today there are the sister boys and brother uh, sister girls and brother boys um you know, they're still there in Aboriginal culture. So I don't want to, I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is this isn't just something that was in the past. There are traditions in, in many, many cultures that predate colonialism. There are ancient traditions of gender, like, uh, gender diversity. People can be assigned as other than male or female. There's other places to be on the gender spectrum in many other cultures that that's was true in ancient times and it's still true so i i just i guess what i'm trying to get to is i don't want to erase the contemporary reality that those identities still actively exist in those cultures now yeah and then what what is your understanding uh donovan of what occurred um when the in the West, for example, you know, with the rise of Judeo Christianity and then Islam, uh, what what happened then to gender and uh, sexuality? And I'm asking this because I know one of the things that you do as part of your current professional uh, sort of contribution is is really to look at the uh, the issue of trauma, and right? how to emerge beyond the trauma that's been inflicted uh, by uh, our religious traditions. But I'd love to have you share your understanding of how that arose, what were the consequences, and, and, um, and how it's uh, creating such extraordinary trauma in people's lives. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's another one where I really lean into um, 
uh, one of the many gifts of of coming out and being in acceptance of being different in gender is that I've been, uh, it's helped me connect with or it's connected with me with people that have been doing this work in their own cultures for a long, long time. So I lean into what, um, what people who are Muhiz and, and who are two spirits have to say about these things, uh, the collective trauma that there's, their people experienced from colonialism um, is very much connected, and this is this is documented uh, very well in history. But but um, for example, I think of Balboa uh, uh, coming in, you know, because I'm in I'm in California, um, but but. Um, yeah, the conquistadors, not, they weren't unique in this, but coming in, whether it was in Florida or whether it was here in, in, in where I am in California, uh, coming in and um, Christianizing, setting up missions. I'm thinking, I'll just use California as an example because I'm right here and I live, I can see the, the San Diego mission from where I live right now. So it's very vivid in my mind and how the Kumei people were treated uh, by those missionaries. So bringing, Coming to get the land, <laughs> the, the religion, the missions work went hand in hand with that and convincing, I think, convincing European people that it was okay to do this, packaging it up in a sort of religious mission where we're going to save souls and then coming in and doing things that have absolutely nothing to do with religion once they're on the land, you know, enslaving indigenous people and forcing them to build the mission then forcing them at point of you know we're going to slit your throat if you don't convert to christianity get baptized where the if you travel in mexico you'll see in the in the in mexican churches the artwork of this bloody gory time and what it was really like um if you go to the missions if they're if they're including indigenous his, history and the history of the missions now like the one here in san diego does it they include the kumeye perspective on it it's not a pretty story it's very very clear one of the ways that that people were colonized was to also you know hold the knife to their throat or threaten to burn them or whatever or whip them throat uh, there's there's actually illustrations uh, uh from the time engravings of the time of uh of, of the conquistadors uh, unleashing dogs on you know same-sex couples or people who were hermaphrodites as they called it back uh, an intersex person back then um if you didn't conform to their patriarchal cis heteronormative biblical and it's not accurately biblical but this is how it was being used it was a tool to divide and conquer you know we, we you're christian now so you're going to do gender this way you know and, and I get very emotional about it, so I don't know if I'm being very articulate, but, you know, a person can easily use the Internet to search for contemporary engravings uh, of, of the things that were done to, um, as again, I'll use the word hermaphrodite. We don't use that word anymore, but if you were to you do an Internet search of colonial settlers, invaders, however you want to frame that, uh, missionaries dealing with hermaphrodites, um, you would you would get some very graphic illustrations of that, and you would also see engravings of how those early missionaries were astonished that hermaphrodites, as you alluded to before, were the healers and the shamans in their traditions. You know, there are there are engravings of, from those times of hermaphrodites, as they were called, uh, carrying the sick on stretchers and and to places where they could be healed and and, and nursed and cared for. And that was their role in that society because they were seen as in between uh, and having exceptional understanding of the human body that included both maleness and female fail maleness from within. They, they internally could understand and relate to women and men with equal care. That was seen as just a really blessed place to be in a place of deep wisdom uh, to be very healing for other people. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a important kind of, I would say, philosophical point that you're making, this honoring of the place in between. And uh, because one thinks of the, you know, the original sort of definition and vocation of the shaman, the shaman was that person in the, in the tribe that understood the language of society, but also the language of nature. Yes. Uh, and he or she could be 
um, you know, a high priest, but could also morph into nocturnal imaginal realms into a falcon or an eagle, and was the translator between the worlds and the uh, the hermaphrodite and the intersexual uh, uh, individuals had that same capacity. And that's anathema to the dogmatism of the Abrahamic religions that want to put things in categories. There's the creator, there's the created, there's the Jew, there's the Gentile, there's the believer, there's the non-believer. Uh, and you see it even in terms of of Western uh, academia and education. Our universities are in silos. And, you know, for example, going back to what I started the session with around the ancient understanding that the movement of the stars and the planets and the movement of the instruments and music were one and the same. And that the sound could enable one to understand the harmony of the spheres, the music of the spheres, that is non-existent in Western academia because astronomy is astronomy. Musicology is musicology. Uh, and that's just, there's, there's no conceivable connection between those. So it's a mentality that is not only debilitated the fluidity of gender, but also the fluidity of art and science as one interrelational whole. So it's a, I would say it's an existential um, uh, deconstruction of the wholeness of life that also had gender and sexual implications. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. I mean, what you're just saying is, uh, that's what that, that book, the book that I wrote, it's, it's about 500 pages, heavily footnoted, <laughs> Sex and Sacrament, but that's really what it's about. And it's, it's actually kind of arguing just a tiny bit that that's inherent, more than a tiny bit, is in arguing with the idea that that's inherent to the Abrahamic traditions. Because yes. what I really feel in, an encounter is a pulse of wholeness and shalom and uh sexy sacredness in by meeting the, the the sacred through our bodies our, the body being god created um and, and then i don't want to digress into that but but there are certainly impulses that are healthful and whole in any of those traditions as well and there are folks that for their own reasons distorted what was there or have focused on certain narrow things or have imposed as you use the word dogma in position of dogma on something that was very messy creative poetic and musical and very embodied i mean i think and and cite frequently david dancing naked in front of the ark of the covenant through the streets pissing off his way you know that that's that's the hero of the bible right is this naked guy dancing in the street and he's a king he was he was definitely not um dogmatic right <laughs> he wasn't narrow uh and he also had a male lover jonathan you know so so the bible and it's it's the traditions that could come out of it for us don't have to be narrow and confining i'm not trying to make an argument for the bible here i just I, I i feel like the pulse of life that affirms everything and that is creative it pulses even in those narrow streams and uh anyway i do agree with you i, I understand with what, what you're saying yes well it's yeah. worth uh, just uh pausing for a moment on the bible because you know as you know even in the story of jesus uh he had a beloved disciple uh john uh, but as we're discovering more and more, he also had a beloved disciple with Mary Magdalene. And there are, are deep indications that Jesus, you know, was, was, I would say, gender fluid. I mean, he had a capacity to love men and love a woman uh, with equal passion. And that was part of the scandal um, that was generated around him. Um, similarly with David, dancing naked, you know, and, and it, I, can, I know the, having been born the son of a missionary, I know the, the great lines that said that, that David's love for Jonathan was greater than his love for any woman. Uh, and so that David and Jonathan have become kind of an archetype 
of uh, like Achilles and, and Proclus uh, in the Iliad, uh, Jesus and, and uh, John the disciple uh, uh, in, the, in the Gospels of uh, deep, passionate um, love of people that are identified uh, as uh, paragons of virtue uh, and greatness, like nothing compares to King David in the Bible, and of course, Jesus in the New Testament. I mean, and given the fact that you're such a biblical scholar, uh, expound for a moment on those strands in the biblical tradition that would indicate that uh, uh, gender fluidity was, was, was active, uh, even within the strictures of, of the time. Yeah, and that, that's really, um, on that one, that's what the second book is about. There's this two-volume series I did this year called Queer Liberation Theology and Praxis. And um, this, the second one is a collection of my sermons and biblical commentaries. And it's organized by, in the order that the Bible is. So it's organized, the sections are Torah, uh, wisdom, sorry, Torah, prophets, wisdom, gospels, apostolic writings, and then I have a section on queer liturgies that I've done with some of those students that you saw in the pictures. But anyway, all that to say, I've written on that a lot, and and uh, so have other people. Of course, I cite fully in there that there are so many other uh, folks that have come before us that have unpacked this stuff for us. But the story that really stands out for me and just shocked me after I came out and started to get it, getting to know people that had been doing this work for many, many years, uh, one of the lesbian elders in the metropolitan church community, church tradition, reached out to me and said, um, you know, there's this story where, where Jesus heals the Roman centurion's lover. And he says that that the Roman centurion has a faith greater than all those in, of Israel. And you know, you do know that the word that's in the original Greek is the word for gay lover. It's not his servant. It's not his son. It's pais. And I was like, what? You know. And that by this time, I was forty-eight or forty-nine, and I had been teaching theology for twenty years. I'd been, you know, preaching and 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 had been a minister for almost thirty years or whatever. So I was really this was the first I'd heard of it, and I had to study this for myself. Now, when I was in the seminary, I took Greek and Hebrew, so I had a little bit of ability to look at this. And it, in fact, it's true that that in and I ended up writing on it for Huffington Post, and then I wrote, you know, it's included as a chapter in this this book. But um, but yeah, Matthew eight, the word that Jesus uses, and that the writer of the gospel. This is what surprised me even more. Not just Jesus, because I was like, well, okay, maybe Jesus was edgy. We, my Jim and I can agree on that. But the writer of the gospel actually uses this word twice, even when Jesus isn't talking. The word pais is a word for uh, the receptive partner in a relationship between two men, a sexual loving relationship. And it, it connotes not just the sexual transaction, but a deep love, uh, a committed relationship. So, and that word, it's translated into English always in all the translations I can find as servant. And that word, in fact, is used, the word doula, servant, is used in, uh, in the Luke version of this story, Gospel of Luke. But in the Gospel of Matthew, which is older, the word is pais, and if you look anywhere else but a Bible dictionary, Greek to English, if you look any other ancient Greek literature lexicons, that word is always used in Greek literature outside of the Bible for a committed same-sex partnerships between men. Mm. So Jesus blessed that. Jesus healed that person, didn't, not just out of the goodness of, not just in a tolerant way. That's what really spoke to me back in those early days after my coming out when I was starting to get to know other queer people that decided to stay in the church and continue to minister is that, that this wasn't, a, you know, let's agree to disagree or love the sin, but hate the, love the sinner, but hate the sin. You know, the, the, the mere, teeth gritting tolerance that you get in some churches where our presence might be tolerated, but we darn well better not get married or we, and we certainly can't be ministers. Um, Jesus didn't, he said, you, your faith is greater. I wish, I wish that the other people that I know, the Jewish people that I hang out with had faith like yours. And he said this to an openly gay man. 
So that to me uh, is, is a very, very powerful story that's in the Bible, not only in the Bible, but it's in the Gospels. And if you're like, you were raised by missionaries, so you know what I'm talking about. If you're one of those old fashioned people that had the red letter Bibles, those really conservatives had the red letter Bibles and the words of Jesus, for those that aren't in that culture, the words of Jesus were printed in red ink so we could get right to it. And yeah, so the red letter words of Jesus <laughs> affirm the faith of a gay man, an openly gay man, without asking him to repent or uh, uh, stop being with his partner or anything like that. Extraordinary. I did not know yeah. that, Donovan. So thank you for that uh, illumination. Uh, that's just more evidence that that um, there is an under, uh, a deeper strata to life and that these great human beings, these avatars like Jesus, you know, part of what makes an avatar an avatar is that he or she is just out of the box, you know, by definition. And they do things um, that are extraordinary and audacious uh, and uh, world-changing precisely because they don't recognize and accept the, the conventions of their time that keep us all small. And we've all gotten very, very small after 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian-Islamic uh, theology and religion and um, and within that context, I'd love to now bring us to contemporary times. Uh, and just to, I'd like to ask you to share two two aspects. One, how are you understanding this extraordinary foment in culture that is all of a sudden breaking up like a thousand dandelions through concrete with 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 all kinds of gender and sexual fluidity happening, not just in America and the West, but all over the world, almost simultaneously. And then what are you doing professionally in the midst of this foment to kind of aid the revolution? Um, well, as I shared, and this is one reason I shared about my own story, you asked me, but it, it's connects with this question. So as I mentioned in 2013, the diagnostic category or the diagnostic, yeah, the diagnostic category changed for people who have gender difference, who understand their gender to be different than it was when they were the one that assigned at birth. Uh, a similar thing happened in 1972 with, with gayness. Homosexuality until 1972 was classified in the United States, at least, as a mental illness. In 1972, a new version of the diagnostic manual was changed that took that out as a mental illness. And as you know, 1972, since 1972, there's been this amazing uh, gay liberation. Uh, again, you know, like you said, all over the world. I mean, the diagnostic change happened in America, but American medicine and diagnostic categories and 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 uh, I want to say religious ideology as it informs political ideology and policy making decisions. All those things are tangled up together and they do have a disproportionate impact on the rest of the world because uh, of the way America does international politics and wields its influence in the United. You know, I'm sure I don't have to unpack all that for everybody. So, um, uh, so this is what's happened. If you remember what happened in 1972 and beyond, this is what's happened with gender. 2013 marks a shift in the diagnostic category in the treatment. And and, and it didn't come out of nowhere. Like, that's why I brought up Harry Benjamin. Harry Benjamin's publication that revolutionized this for many people in the rest of the world was called The Transsexual Phenomenon. It came out in 1966, which happens to be the year I was born. I'm sure that's a coincidence, but the point is uh, people all over the world who were medical doctors looking for guidance in this matter and behavioral health providers did use Harry Benjamin's work to change the way they were treating uh, people we would call trans, you know, uh, gender minority folks. Um, and, and, you know, it's just taken till 2013 for the rest of behavioral health in the United States to catch up with this and really accept this. Um, there, and the advent of the internet 
is another big piece that I hear a lot from intersex folks, especially. So people with intersex conditions, much like myself, have often around the world have had not had their own diagnoses disclosed to them. Parents of intersex children have often not been told their child is intersex. What happens with intersex people is a lot of times, it didn't happen to me, but a lot of times children, babies born with uh, ambiguous genitalia will be operated upon without their parents' consent even uh, immediately because it's been thought that and this, this hasn't always been true because these kinds of operations weren't always accessible. It used to be a hermaphrodite could just, would just live as a hermaphrodite. But in recent times, uh, 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 babies would be operated upon, sterilized, you know, have their gonads removed if they were external gonads. And, and that was that. And, and not much would be disclosed to the parents. My point is, with the advent of the internet, intersex people have been able to find each other, realize mm. that they're, what they are experiencing in their body isn't just unique to them. The shame that used to be part of having a different kind of an abnormal body is disappearing as people with these conditions find one another, hear their own story of trauma. You brought up trauma before, but the medical trauma of being sterilized as an infant, the fact that the scar tissue doesn't grow with the rest of the body. So there are multiple revisions required for the urinary tract, the sexual organs, things like that over a lifetime as a person during their childhood, their adolescence, and their young adult. It, it, yeah, there's all, all kinds of trauma. So they, yes, they need peer support. You asked me about what I'm doing, what I've really leaned into in my life post theology professor life has been the peer support and trauma recovery work uh, that I needed to do for myself. I mean, I found, I stumbled across these communities using the internet and because people found me. In my case, I, uh, my story went all over the world news. So people used Facebook of all things to find me, direct message me. That's how Trans Lifeline started. I was giving all kinds of peer support to people all over the world who couldn't find anybody else like them and read about me in the news. Uh, I couldn't do all that by myself. I mean, the need is huge. Folks are really, really traumatized, bullied, harassed, and some have medical trauma, family rejection, all kinds of horrible things that they're dealing with. So anyway, so I, you know, I, as I started to get to know other people in the community, we formed this sort of peer support network and launched Trans Lifeline. But there are other peer support networks for intersex folk like Interconnect and Interact. I won't go on and on about that, but, but community organized, not going through these things alone. Um, that's a gift I have from the years that I did live in religious community is this belief in what we used to call koinonia. You might know that frame phrase, Jim, but that the Christian understand, or yeah, it's, it's a Greek term from the Christian Bible, but the idea of the fellowship or the community, um, but there's something holy about when we come together, there's ways we can support each other and be for and with each other that, that are just deeply exceed what we can handle as an individual. I, can, I feel like I'm going on and on. I'm maybe over. No, 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 no. There's, there's so much more I could say, but I'm going to pause. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I think that leads us to a question that Kurt Kruger is asking, which I, I think is the $64,000 question. What works best in your experience for expanding people's acceptance of the kind of diversity that you're speaking about. Because we are, we're in a world where there's a lot of people for whom this is not okay. And the number of people that are the transgender people, particularly women, particularly women of color that are being killed and murdered. Um, I mean, the, there's you know, an infinite list of stories that one could tell. Um, so we're in a compacted reality, not unlike the, 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 the dynamic around race. The more racial diversity uh, expands, the more intense is the opposition um, from um, sort of the right wing and the fundamentalist aspects of society. So as you've navigated through this, Donovan, what, what are some useful tips or wise counsel that you could provide us for how do we enter into this conversation in a way that generates acceptance? Yeah, that is the $64,000 question. You're absolutely right. In my experience, now that I've been doing this for almost a decade, 
um, and we talked about this a little bit before the cameras turned on. Uh, people, people have very deep emotional reactions. And uh, in my experience, it's one reason I stepped away from the Huffington Post work and writing in the advocate and doing, I don't usually do events like what we're doing today. I'm, I'm doing this today because there's a follow-up class that we're doing on it. And this, this is connected with that, but I don't normally go around telling my story and trying to change people's minds anymore because what I've found is that um, the reactions you're talking about it's more useful to me to approach it from a standpoint of trauma and trauma and, and resilience building. My, what I'm trying to get to is that I've found that reasoning with people, showing people the things that I showed you, I do think it's useful, very useful. If a person's already de-escalated and open mm. to learning, I like to start with things that are just, look, here's history, here's science. They're neutral, right? They're not, I'm not arguing gender ideology with you. I'm just like, look at the diversity in world cultures. Let's look at a map. Let's look at people. And then let's look at babies when they're born. You know, there are things we can't really, we can't, if we're calm, <laughs> they're not really thinking, we're not arguing about it. We're just kind of exploring our world and the wonder, di wonderful diversity in our human history and biology. Um, however, the folks you're talking about, that's not where they're at. In my experience, folks that are having these kind of really uh, entrenched reactions about gender are in terror. Okay, and that's why I began. What's helped me the most is to study polyvagal theory and brain response. People who are in fight or flight because they, they're feeling like this is a threat to their very existence are not gonna be able to look at maps or pictures of babies' genitals or you know, pictures of me when I was a kid, they're, they're just not going to be able to process that because that part of their brain isn't accessible to them when they're in terror. And, I, and, and this is what's allowed me to live with compassion for people that literally actively try to kill my friends, my children, myself. Um, I, I, how am I navigating a world like that? Uh, if I understand that they really, they're really terrified and they may not, they may not be able to admit that they may not be able to find words for that. But um, if they believe that their God has created a world where people can only be male or female uh, and the, the assign, other human, I mean, it's obvious to me, I'm, the humans assign gender. God didn't, but God's not the one writing an F or an M on the birth certificate. That's so a human being can make an error. And really, we're not questioning whether God made an error in making that baby. We're, we're talking about human error. But regardless of that, for some folks, this is all playing around in who is my God? What are you saying about my God and the way my God works and, and who I am? And it seems to me when you used the phrase existential threat when we were talking earlier, it seems to me people that are deeply entrenched and having extreme reactions to something that really doesn't have an, it, it, nobody else is affected by how I live in my body. If I grow a beard or shave it, if I call myself Heather or Donovan, nobody really else is affected by that. It has an if, impact on me, but it really doesn't threaten anybody else's life, not really. I don't know if y'all can see that, but I mean, it, it just, it just doesn't. It's just whether I'm at home in my own skin, I mean, I'm more or less pleasant to be with if I'm feeling good about myself, but it's not life-threatening to anybody else. <clears throat> However, uh, uh, I think uh, my observation is folks that um, find this to be a life-threatening terror to them are probably have some things inside themselves that they're scared to look at and scared to face and uh, um, scared of the consequences. The consequences are, are, I like to remember, it helps me to remember, it's not just snakes under the carpet. A person who might be afraid to face their own coming out has every reason to be terrified because in fact, we disproportionately do lose our families, our jobs. Uh, we, we disproportionately live in poverty. There's a lot of scary things we often have to face. We, yeah. And you brought up that we might have to face uh, uh, death threats, uh, assault, all those things that you talked about. For, there's a lot at stake when a person comes out. So uh, I try to remember that and be gentle and compassionate. I don't know 
what that person's inner journey is and you ask for tips. I know that might have sounded like here's all the things that aren't going to work. If, if I'm remembering that, it's easier for me to be a person among people and be gentle with that person, no matter how angry they're coming at me. If I, this is my practical tip to come across with an open heart. I don't have to agree with them. I don't have to argue with them and just have compassion for whatever their struggle is. The best case scenario is if they are to, if they are at some point to meet and be around a person who is trans intersex or a parent of a trans kid or intersex kid, they get to know people as people and find out they're not being threatened, that we're not arguing, that we're not attacking, we're not trying to take your God away, we're not trying to force you to live out if you're not, you know, we're not even going to ask you questions about that. Like you're on your journey and you're going to be able to go at your own pace. So just honestly, Jim, the things I learned as a theology professor, I couldn't get a job for several years and I actually became a security guard. <laughs> and it's what I learned by being trained as a security guard, as a person with a PhD, just working. Um, that was actually the most useful stuff I learned about how to deal with this situation is, is how to have a calm demeanor, a calm, benevolent, kind, caring demeanor in my voice, my facial expression, my body language. That's actually been way more helpful than all the things I learned in my PhD about gender and sex. <laughs> That's brilliant, actually, uh, Donovan. The best way to persuade people is to be authentically just who you are and to be comfortable in your own skin and radiate that authenticity to others in the hope that the grace of God will be sufficient to somehow catalyze a deeper understanding uh, in the people who are witnessing your presence. So I think that's sage advice uh, because it requires us all to engage in some pretty deep reflection about our authenticity. So thank you. I, I really want to thank you for today's uh, dialogue. And uh, uh, Donovan mentioned a, a course. Uh, I've put a, a link in the chat a couple of times. I'll uh, do it again right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a course in July. Uh, it's a second one of our liberal arts. Normally we have it in Chartres in France. That's uh, where Ubiquity University has its mystery school in Chartres. And we commemorate the seven liberal arts in this next year. Uh, we're doing the second liberal art in July on dialectica. It's the relationship with the other. It's around the sexual chakra. So we're looking at this intersectionality between gender and sexuality on the one hand, but also race and ethnicity on the other hand, uh, because that uh, is also up for us with George Floyd and the trial of Derek Chauvin and the killing of black males on a daily basis all over the United States. Um, and we're working on a, a dialogue with Donovan and Eve Ensler uh, of the Vagina uh, Monologues and Andrew Harvey, a gay mystic and, and other people on the complexities of, um, of gender uh, and ethnicity. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be a very deep, uh, very um, scintillating discussion that we're going to be having uh, in, uh, in July. Uh, and you can sign up for it uh, even now uh, as we're gathering momentum toward that date. Uh, uh, but Donovan, um, uh, I think it was Leslie Southwick said in one of the chats, uh, your life is legendary. Uh, your, 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 uh, your microcosm is calling us all to a greater macrocosm of understanding how humans are extraordinarily diverse. And just as a tribute to you, sir, I want to recite some lines from Rilke, the great German poet Rilke. Uh, it's one of my favorite poems from him. He says, time and time again in history, some special people wake up. They have no ground in the crowd. They move to broader laws. 
They carry strange customs with them and demand room for bold and audacious action. The future speaks ruthlessly through them. They change the world. Donovan, the future has spoken ruthlessly through you. And you're changing the world. I just want to salute you and thank you for your presence today on Humanity Rising. Uh, and if you have time, I know the people in our after session chat would love uh, to have your presence there. You can get the link uh, in the chat box um, if Kurt or someone will, will put it in right now. And all of you who want a deeper dive into this most extraordinary man, uh, uh, you're all welcome. Um, and then tomorrow, everyone, on Humanity Rising, we're going to have a dialogue with a, uh, a man named Bruce Cryer, uh, who is the original CEO of the Heart Math Institute. And so he's going to tell us about the heart origins of heart math uh, and uh, its implications to healing. Uh, so that's tomorrow on Humanity Rising. But Donovan, we salute you. Uh, we thank you. And we look forward to you joining us for Dialectica in July uh, in a company of others for this very deep and abiding conversation. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.